Hi there, I'm Dennis Sturz. Welcome to Video Game Culture and Theory at Seton Hill during J-Term 2012. I'm really happy to be teaching this class. I'm glad to be meeting you. And this little video is just kind of an informal introduction to the course. Uh, there's a more formal introduction to video game studies and another formal lecture that introduces video game theory. But for now, this is just a, an informal discussion where I welcome you to the course and kind of walk you through a couple of the basic details. The first thing you need to know is this website, this uh, blogs.seatonhill.edu slash games. This is where you come to find out all the details about the course. Today we have Monday's course items on top. And the way I've written it is you just start at the top and you work your way through. And then now I've done Mondays and I start on Tuesdays. And uh, as the course progresses, um, the current information will always be at the, at the top of this page. Uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to be teaching a class from home, particularly as I was listening to the weather reports uh, Sunday night and realizing just how, uh, you know, how, how happy I am to not have to uh, drive out there in you know, what might be snow or, or bad weather. Uh, here I am at home, though, with my family, and at any minute, you know, somebody may burst in and say there's a bug that needs to be squished or something needs to be picked off the top shelf. So although it's convenient to be teaching a class from home, there are also distractions, and, and I've been focusing on those distractions by making a schedule for myself and really thinking what I have to get done in the, you know, over the next couple um, next couple weeks. Uh, a J, our J term schedule is pretty tight. We have twelve scheduled calendar days for J term. It's about uh, uh, sorry, we have twelve work days. It's about seventeen calendar days. But uh, however you slice it, we have in that short space of time to cover the amount of material that a regular semester long class would be able to stretch out over fifteen weeks. So if you realize each week of class, you'll have about two and a half hours of instruction. And you know that dedicated students, successful students, will put a minimum of two hours of outside class time for every hour of inside class time. So when you realize we're covering a little bit more than a week's worth of material each day during the uh, J term, then uh, you know do the math and realize the amount of time that it might take to uh, get the the level of success that you're shooting for in this class. So uh, I'll walk you very briefly through this uh, first page. Um, we're just looking at the course overview. This for your information topic. There's no homework that you have to do here. This is just something for you to take a look at. Here where it says Moodle, this is an activity that you will com complete in the learning environment uh, of moodle.seatonhill.edu. There is an, a, a later item that shows you exactly what I mean by that, so don't worry about that for now. This first assignment simply asks you to watch this video and uh, uh, post some comments in which you respond to the video, and I'm asking you to do that sometime on Monday. There's a part two to the video that asks you to complete an activity in the course Moodle. And this tools walkthrough one exercise will tell you a little bit more about how to do that Moodle activity. So that part is not due until uh, tomorrow morning. So um, this is an important item because I've already started giving you some deadlines for some stuff that's coming up pretty quickly. So this course uh, item on pacing the course, there's no homework for you to do on this item, but this is an important reference for you so you can see that this work which I've assigned for Monday. Uh, I, I think, you know, as long as you're not starting this at, you know, 11 o'clock at night, you can probably get all this stuff done on Monday, but recognize there's also some things that are due on Tuesday. So I think it would be good for you to start this early, get this done out of the, out of the way early, and then start working on Tuesday's assignments Monday night, because uh, you can see there's a steady stream of due dates. Now, I've set these due dates up based on when I think I will get to marking these materials. This doesn't mean that uh, I'm expecting you to spend exactly this much time on each of these assignments. You can, you know, you really should start them early and do them at your own pace. Uh, but for these first couple days, uh, I'm just sort of giving you a, a schedule here for when I expect the, the work to be in because this is when I'm going to start assessing it. Uh, 
So I'll just walk you through this. These assignments that I've assigned on Monday, watching a video, familiarizing yourself with the tools, reading a few game reviews, and then writing a brief response. It'll only take you, you know, a couple hours to do that. And then this is just a page for you to refer to. There's no uh, homework for you to look at on this page. Anyway, those items, I will start assessing them. These are due. Uh, I'm ass assigning them on the second. I'm going to start assessing them on the third. And these other items that are listed on the third, I will also uh, assess, them on, assess them on the third. So um, that moves us up to Wednesday. The items that are listed for Wednesday, I haven't listed them here on this page. You'll have to click on this link to find out what they are. I'll let you do that on your own. But these items are due at 10 a.m. on Wednesday. So just think of it as all assignments are generally uh, for the course website, unless I say otherwise. If an assignment is mentioned on a day, it's generally supposed to be due that day at 10 a.m. I'm giving you an extension for the work that's assigned on Monday and Tuesday so that you can um, sort of get into the course rhythm and figure out what that is. Okay? So, uh, all right. So, um, uh, the course content will include some lectures like this one, where your job is just sort of to sit passively and absorb and and uh, listen to the material and recall it and apply it when asked to later on. Uh, there will also be, uh, early in the course, a few more professionally produced documentaries for you to watch. But far more important, really, to the really understanding the depth of the course is the interaction you will get with your peers. And it may be hard to interact with peers that you don't know in an online course when you only know them as a, you know, a name on a list. So... Uh, uh, an early exercise will ask you kind of to break the ice and introduce yourself, doing something like what I'm doing right now. So uh, let me start off by um, introducing myself to those of you who don't know me. I know about half of you, but we know each other uh, not in the context of video gaming, and the other half of you I don't know at all. So I'll, I'll just tell you a bit about myself. I've been at Seton Hill since 2003 when I was hired to start up a program in new media journalism. I teach journalism classes and new media classes, and I teach literature and freshman writing. And I teach this video game class about every two years. And um, uh, my wife sometimes teaches part-time at Seton Hill. She'll teach literature classes occasionally, and uh, we homeschool a 13-year-old son and a 9-year-old daughter. My kids are um, active gamers, as most kids in that age bracket are. And... Um, Let's see, when I was about their age in around the early 1980s, my parents brought home a personal computer. It was pretty cutting age at the time. The games were, you know, the graphics were blocky and the, the sounds were, you know, bleep and buzzes and the horrible sounds, but the games were fun. We enjoyed them. Uh, as much as playing the games, we also enjoyed uh, uh, writing games, creating games. We would get magazines that have, would have code listings in the back, and you would type out this code and tweak it and adjust it and, you know, make your own uh, um, personalizations to it. But this code would allow you to create games that looked just as good as the professional games that we were buying. And that was really pretty thrilling. That was the good side about the fact that the graphics were so crummy, is even a bunch of kids could um, manage to make them look like the professional games. So, uh, as a teenager, I played games like uh, Pac-Man and Star Raiders, and I played uh, uh, text games, story games like Zork. Uh, as a teen and college student, I played uh, graphic adventure games, uh, Space Quest, King's Quest. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, uh, Myst was a very popular game. And I still, to this day, prefer games that have exploration and story. Those are my favorite kinds of games, although I play a lot of different games. Um, an important gaming moment for me, a story that I that I find very you know, influential about my own history of games, was in 2002, late one night, I installed the game Deus Ex. I had bought the Game of the Year edition, and it was a very impressive game, a first-person shooter that had role-playing elements and puzzle-solving elements. Uh, when you finished a level, you would get experience points, and you would uh, you could buy augmentations for your character. So if you wanted to play a more stealthy way, you could get a shield. Or if you wanted to be more aggressive, you could, you know, get muscles that would allow you to be, uh, to, to take more damage or something like that. And, um, 
Uh, so I finished the first level and loved it, and my wife came in the room and said, It's time! She was very pregnant with our second child at the time, so we went to the hospital. I didn't get back to playing that game for a couple weeks, but it really did have a strong impact on me. I really liked the way the the different path that you could choose for your character affected the way the story progressed. And um, you could go back into a level that you had gone through uh, a stealth mode without shooting a single bullet. You could go back again and play it completely differently, and you would make your goal be that you leave no enemy alive at that level. It was it, it, the, the challenge was very different when you played it different ways with characters that you had taken along different developmental paths. So I really liked that combination of first-person shooter and puzzle-solving and role-playing game. There were even dialogue trees. You had a conversation, voice acting, um, which was still fairly new at the time, fully voiced dialogue, and a very complex plot as well. So that was Deus Ex. Uh, for me, Deus Ex is right up there with Half-Life 2 and Portal, as a groundbreaking game that fused elements of uh, story and first-person shooting and um, uh, 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 third third-person uh, platform jumpers and a little bit of um, uh, character development as well. So uh, uh, another important element about Deus Ex, the uh, Game of the Year edition, came with a level editor. And so back in 2003-2004, I was uh, uh, I would have some fun. Uh, creating my own levels, um, uh, early modding scene. So, um, I also like uh, fantasy role-playing games. My kids and I play Dungeons & Dragons online together. Uh, over the years I've played the Elder Scrolls games 2, 3, and 4. I have not uh, yet bought the most recent uh, version 5. I'm waiting for the price to go down. And uh, lately, though, I've found that I've spent uh, I have as much fun creating games as um, playing them. So I've been uh, developing some games in a, a free open source design tool called Blender 3D. Uh, I've also been teaching my kids how to design in a 2D environment called Scratch. Um, so that's a little bit of my own personal history back there for games. Those are some, some of the ways that I play games uh, uh, for fun. These are games that I would choose to play on my own. When you study uh, a subject at the college level, or teach a subject at a college level, uh, learning about the general subject of, of games, it requires us to stretch our experience. It requires us to go beyond simply playing the games that we would ordinarily choose to play, and uh, focusing on games that are good subjects of study, because they illustrate a trend, they might capture a moment in history, they might demonstrate a striking new use of a media. The, the, the designer may be doing something innovative, or the designer may be being challenging or even offensive in such a way that stretches our understanding of what a game can do, what a game can do to us, and how we respond to it. So, um, uh, maybe a game is really bad, and we study a game to find out what could possibly have, you know, what kind of forces could have combined to make a game like this that is this bad go out on the market? These teach us about ourselves as gamers. They teach us about the public reaction to games. They teach us about what makes games good or bad. So we will in this class be studying some games that you might never on your own decide to pick up and, and, and actually play uh, uh, for yourself. The Introduction to Game Studies video that's that's also on the syllabus from Monday uh, goes into that kind of thing in a little bit more detail. There's another video that introduces video game, or introduces the whole concept of theory and applies it to video games. But my immediate point right now is to confess that um, as a game studies researcher and teacher, I'm very conscious that gaming is such a huge environment. There is no way I can play every game out there. There's no way that I will become an expert at every kind of game out there. There's no way that I will like every game that's out there. Uh, so I, I'm not personally, for instance, a fan of the Grand Theft Auto series of games, but I do have a great interest in emergent gameplay. That's the kind of gameplay where the game world is so complex that the designers have put together complex items in ways that allow the players to 
uh, mix and remix and sort and try different things so that the players will find gaming opportunities within the game world that the designers never even imagined were there. A great example is uh, The Sims. Early editions of The Sims did not really have any sort of storytelling capability. Early players took screenshots and used blogs to tell stories. The original designers of The Sims had no idea that people would be that interested in telling stories within The Sims. So by watching how people played their game, they added new features to make that game more interesting. So that's an, an example of emergent uh, gameplay. The Grand Theft Auto series is full of emergent gameplay, and even though I am not particularly interested in sports games or racing games, uh, I couldn't resist picking up a copy of this uh, of Grand Grand Te Theft Auto uh, Vice City when I saw a cheap copy of it um, in order to see what all the fuss was about. And I do really appreciate the gameplay even though you know I probably would never on my own pick up a, a racing game uh, by itself. I would be picking up the game in order to explore a really complex virtual world. Okay, uh, 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 I personally have no particular interest in uh, uh, combat games like Mortal Kombat or something like that. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that Mortal Kombat is not uh, uh, worthy of study in a game studies course. Uh, certainly, in the outside world, the Mortal Kombat series has been criticized for uh, you know encouraging violent behavior. Because of the huge response to these uh, uh, fighting games, that itself is a reason why I am interested in studying these games, even though I personally wouldn't pick up um, a Mortal Kombat and play it uh, on my own. Uh, I don't play casual games on Facebook, and uh, uh, even though one of the units in this course will explore the casual gaming phenomenon, um, those older players who tend to play uh, Facebook, or, or, or it's, uh, often women, uh, whatever, they uh, don't tend to match the stereotype of the Call of Duty fanboy. So um, uh, it's w worth exploring these games, even though I don't particularly find in I don't pardon, I don't particularly find interest in playing those games. Okay, uh, just because I personally don't have an interest in them does not mean they are not worthy of study. Likewise, if there's a particular game that you're not terribly interested in, I hope you will be open-minded enough to see what you can learn about gaming, gaming culture, and yourself when you encounter a game that is not necessarily the kind of game you would consider fun on your own. Okay. So no two of us in this class are likely to have the same gaming experiences. So we have a, a plenty of knowledge that other people lack. And uh, my goal for the first week or so of the class is to set up a framework so we learn how to study games. And the, the games that we'll pick to study... Um, uh, I've picked games that have been around long enough that scholars have been able to study the development in that genre, to trace the influence of that game, and uh, uh, gaming studies as a discipline has sort of picked several pet games that everybody uses as a touchstone. And we'll touch on some of those older games uh, uh, in order to introduce us ourselves to the set of skills that you can then apply to the more recent games, the more current games, the games that you love, the games that you want to explore more deeply. But we'll start by picking some classic games. Uh, we'll start by looking at uh, Pac-Man as one of the games we'll look at. We'll also look at uh, a genre of text adventure games. Uh, no graphics at all, only words. These were popular in the late 70s through the 1980s. And uh, we'll see much of what went into uh, the gameplay in Pac-Man and what went into the gameplay of these uh, early text games still survives even though the visuals are different, the audio is different, the controllers are different. Uh, we study older games for the same reason that generals study you know, Roman wars and artists study ancient art. Uh, our tools are very different. Our product is different. The culture in which these things exist in the present is very different. But if you're studying games, games are games whether they are old or new. War is war, art is art. 
whether they're old or new, whether your tools are uh, uh, you know rugged and rustic or whether they're cutting edge. So um, uh, the uh, overview that I've just given is just a basic quick overview that uh, gives you a, a flavor of what's going on for this course. So the uh, next item on the agenda will be for you to move on and watch uh, about a 25-minute video that introduces the subject of game studies. Uh, I'm recycling a lecture that I created two years ago for the video game class at that time. I think it's perfectly fine. There's nothing in it that's out, out of date other than the year 2010 that you'll see in the video in various places. But um, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Um, you can leave a comment on this page, uh, on the course website, or here on the YouTube um, file. Uh, I'm uh, I try to be very accessible. The syllabus has all that, uh, all my contact information in it, and I look forward to hearing from you and learning from you as the course proceeds. Okay, happy gaming and happy learning.